Well now, I'm going to be talking about this book. It's a book that will make you wise, but not clever. There are plenty of other books you can read to make you clever, but this book, and this is the only book to do it, will make you wise. And I'd rather be wise than clever. Clever, you make a lot of money. Wise, you make the most of life. Now, people read this book in different ways. Some people use what I call the medicinal method. Ten verses a day keeps the, by the devil away kind of thing. But other people use devotional notes, and I have the sneaky feeling that they study the notes more than they study the book, and that they read through the selected passage quickly and then study the notes on it. How did God mean us to read his word? Well, I want to begin by telling you that this word Bible originally is a plural word, not a single singular word. It's the word Biblia, and it means books. And this is a collection of books. It's a library. There are different kinds of books here. There are songs, there are proverbs, there are history books, there are prophetic books. And it's terribly important that we read the Bible book by book. You see, somebody has damaged our Bibles very badly. They have put chapter and verse numbers in it. And many Christians have become text people. And we quote John 3.16. And I'm always quoting Hezekiah 3.16. And I make that say whatever I like, and I see people hunting through their Bible <laughs> to try and find Hezekiah 3.16. It's not there. And uh, somebody, somebody who'd listened to my tapes for a long time said, David, why is it you're supposed to be a Bible teacher, but you never give chapter and verse numbers? I say, no, they're not part of the Word of God, and God never intended them to be there. It has divided up God's Word in a way that he never intended. What other book would you read in which every sentence was numbered? Well, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? So here we have a collection of different books. And we need to ask of each book, what kind of a book is it? Why was it written? What's it all about? Now, I've written a book called Normal Christian Birth, and to my surprise, when it was published, it's about being born again and how to help people into the new birth. But to my surprise, when it came out, the British Library in the front has catalogued it under childbirth. <laughs> and so now, if you want to get this book in your public library, you'll have to get it in the section under gynecology. <coughs> Wouldn't it be crazy to go to your library and take out a book of gardening if you want to know about cooking? Or to take out a novel if you want to study computers? And yet people pick texts from all over the Bible without any regard to context, without asking where they're finding it, and they say, this is the Word of God. A classic example of that is the text, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now what kind of thing is that about? I often ask a congregation, what kind of thing can you do through Christ? And they tell me, witness, heal, pray. I say, but that text has nothing whatever to do with those things. It's about being able to live on your income. And it's a very, very relevant text today. And Paul says, I've learned to be content whether I've got a lot of money or a little money. I've learned how to manage. And you know, I found recently in one church, two-thirds of the congregation were in debt. I needed to learn the meaning of that text. I can manage on my salary. I can manage on my wages through Christ who strengthens me. I can manage on my pension. Very relevant. But you see, if you take the text out of its context, you lose its meaning altogether. And the book in which a text occurs is the major context of that verse and gives it its whole meaning. Now we're going to begin with the Gospels. They are a unique kind of book. In the New Testament we've got history books, we've got letters, we've got one prophetic book. But we have four books which are quite unique. There's nothing quite like them in any other literature, and we call them Gospels. Now what is a Gospel? It's not a biography. It's certainly not an autobiography because Jesus never wrote any books. But it's not a straight biography either because over one-third of the pages of each Gospel describe the death of Jesus. Now, I don't know of any other biography that spends a third of its pages on someone's death, however spectacular or tragic the death may have been. So what is a gospel? 
The nearest thing I can get to it in modern life is this. It is a news bulletin. It's a news announcement. And when you read them, you get the sense straight away that there's an exciting bit of news to share and that really it should be read aloud. And I suggest that even when you're by yourself, by yourself, you might get more out of it by reading it aloud to yourself. Reading it aloud to others, you get far more out of it. As I found, I love reading the Bible to people, even more than preaching. Because when I'm reading the Bible, every word is worth hearing. When I'm preaching, that's not quite true. So it's a unique literary form, and the writers of the Gospels were witnesses of something. They actually saw something happen. They heard it happen, and they want to announce it as news to others. So really, a gospel is an extended news bulletin. That's how it came about. But as the time passed, obviously these witnesses to what Jesus did and said were getting fewer and fewer as they died off, as they were killed off. But at the same time, the church was getting bigger and bigger and spreading further and further. So here was a conflict. The number of those who could announce the news, who'd seen it firsthand, was getting smaller. And the number of people who needed to hear this news bulletin were getting bigger. So what was to be done? The answer is they had to write it down quickly and get it down in black and white before they passed away so that we've got this first-hand account of Jesus from these people. Now the first thing that strikes you when you open your Bible is that there are four Gospels. Now why four? Wouldn't it be much more convenient if we only had one? And I'm sure when you read them you realize there's an awful lot of overlap between them. So why four? Why couldn't God get them together and say produce one volume and each of you contribute all that you know? and let's have it all together. And there have been attempts to do this. One of my favorite authors years ago was a man called Freeman Wills Croft. Any of you fans of his? Especially when I lived in Guildford, I enjoyed reading The Crime at Guildford. It's a murder on the hog's back. And uh, <laughs> Freeman Wills Croft was an Anglican lay reader living in Guildford in Surrey. And he wrote detective novels. He was also interested in railways, which I share with him. But he decided to put the four Gospels into one story, and he did this. And there's Freeman Wills Croft's Harmony of the Gospels. It's an inge ingenious thing to do, but it's lost something. And I never read it nowadays. I enjoyed it at first, and I thought that's going to save me a lot of time. Instead of reading all four, I can read it all in one. And then I realized he'd lost a valuable dimension. You see, God duplicates certain things in Scripture. There are two accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. There are two accounts of the history of Israel in Chronicles and Kings. And here we have four accounts of Jesus' life and death. So why? The answer is, for some important things, God has to give us a different angle. And to get the full picture, you need every angle. Sometimes it's a two-dimensional picture, but with Jesus we've got a four-dimensional picture. We see him from four quite different angles. Now, I've not been in prison, but I'm told that if I was, I would have to have my photograph taken like this and like this. But when I said that a month ago, a man who had been through that experience corrected me. He said they now do three mug shots, as he said, to get a full picture of someone's face so that he can really be recognized. One of my favorite machines is Concorde. I just love the shape of that aircraft. It looks as if it's flying even when it's on the ground. There's something about that shape. Now, how would you describe that shape to someone in words? It would be quite a task, wouldn't it? Well, one way you simply describe it as a delta shape. And people understand that as a delta. That's the shape of the Greek letter D or delta. That's why it's called that. But then when you look at, look at it like that, what shape is it now? And in fact, if you wanted to take photographs of the shape of Concord to show someone, you'd have to take at least four or five, or they'd never understand the shape of the thing. 
It looks so amazing from every angle. Well now, Jesus is the most amazing character ever lived. And so God inspired four people to look at him for us and to write down what they saw. Now, it's an easy thing to say that each of them saw a different person, or rather the same person in a different manifestation or attribute. And it's become customary to say that Mark saw Jesus as the Son of Man. He wrote the first gospel and the briefest. And then Matthew came along with the second and saw the King of the Jews. Luke wrote the third to be written and saw the Saviour of the world. And John the fourth. And he saw the Son of God. Well, that's quite a neat way of saying there were four different angles. But we need to dig a bit deeper than that. There are two aspects that we need to look at. Number one, the writer. Oh, I'm jumping ahead. Let's just uh, go through that middle bit. Three stages in writing up the life of a man who's now dead. The first publications usually tell us what the man did. The obituary in the Times tell us what he did. That's the first interest people have in a great person who's gone, what they did. But after a bit, people get more interested in what he said. And they begin to publish his letters and his speeches. But then you'll find a third stage of biography comes when people want to dig behind all that to what the man was, his character, his personality, what motivated him, what made him tick, what was he really like. And the four Gospels actually follow these three stages very significantly. Mark is simply concerned with what Jesus did, his actions, his miracles, and his death and resurrection. Matthew and Luke both have far more about what Jesus said. They've recorded his preaching very much more than Mark ever did. That's why they're both longer, because they both used Mark as their basic outline but then fed into it a whole lot of new material. John, however, was not interested in what Jesus was, sorry, what he did. He was more interested in what he said, but his supreme concern, as we'll see in the next talk, was with what Jesus was. Who was he? His personality, his innermost being. Who was he? Now let's come to this third part. There are two levels at which you can study a gospel. One is from the point of view of the writer. What did he see? How did he understand it? His insight is different from the other three. So what was his insight into Jesus? Because insight is more revealing than sight. But that's only one angle. The other angle at which you need to study a gospel is from the reader's angle. And here we must ask, what was the intention behind the writing of this book? Who was it written for? Why was it written? Because the writer wasn't just getting things off his chest and just telling us what he saw. He was writing for a particular purpose and particular readers. And so whenever we study a gospel, we need to come at it from these two angles. The writer's angle and the reader's angle. The writer's insight and his intention. Who was he hoping to reach? What was he hoping to teach? Well, now I hope that will just lay the foundation for the rest of our study. We're going to just look at Matthew now from these two angles. We call the first three Gospels the Synoptic Gospels. You must have heard that term. It's made up of two Greek words, sin, together, and optic, see, view. And it says these three Gospels have a similar view. They view Jesus together, whereas John, he's just one on his own. And you must have noticed what a difference there is when you leave Matthew, Mark, and Luke and get into John. Let's begin with Mark. Mark is a very exciting piece of journalism. It's sheer journalism, this news announcement. And he rushes through the first months of Jesus' public ministry, but he divides it very carefully into two and a half years and half a year. 
That's his framework. And it's a framework that Matthew and Luke were both going to use. 30 months Jesus ministered up in the north in Galilee, which was a very cosmopolitan area. Lots of different nationalities were there. A very open country and open people. But in Judea in the south were the nationalists, very narrow people, very strict people, very isolated people. And Jesus was very popular in the north and very unpopular in the south. That's why he died in the south, not in the north. The only people who tried to kill him in the north were his own villagers in Nazareth, tried to throw him off a cliff. But on the whole in the north, Jesus was immensely popular. Thousands followed him. When he went to the south, that's when he ran into trouble again and again. So that's the framework. And Mark is building up to a climax in this. And the climax is in the south. There's a kind of leisurely feel about the north. But when you get into the south, the whole thing tightens up and becomes a crisis. Now in another way, he's not only building up to a climax, he's also slowing down to it. And in the first few pages of Mark, you're rushing through the months. And straightway, and straightway, in fact, you rush through two and a half years in a few pages. And straightway he got into a boat, and immediately he was at the other side. Must have been a jet boat or something. But, and immediately, everything's happening immediately. Have you ever noticed that? It's journalism, getting you all excited about everything that was going on. But then the years become months. The next few months, a few pages. And then the months become weeks. And the weeks become one week. And each day is described. And then on the last day, every hour is described. Did you ever notice that? It's like an express train slowing up and coming to a halt. And it halts right in front of the cross. So Mark is building everything up towards the cross and slowing everything down towards the cross. Do you see that combination of building up and slowing down? It's a masterly piece of journalism. And it's probably the best gospel to give a complete outsider to read who just knows nothing about Jesus and wants to know about this exciting person we believe in. Now let's turn straight away to Matthew. We're not looking at Mark now. Matthew uses Mark as his framework, but he has changed it very considerably. First, he's made it much bigger in size. He has added a great deal. He's added all the story of his birth, of his conception, of the wise men coming. You know all the story from Christmas. Now, none of that is in Mark. Mark began his story when Jesus was 30, but Matthew goes away back and adds a whole lot of things. So he starts earlier. He makes a lot of alterations. We'll look at those when we come to them. But he actually changes things in Mark to bring out another aspect. He puts the story of the lost sheep in a completely different context so that the lost sheep is no longer a sinner but is a backsliding Christian. He omits a great deal. But above all, he collects the sayings of Jesus. There's a lot more speech in Matthew. And these sayings are collected into sermons, of which there are five big sermons in Matthew. And the best known is the first, the Sermon on the Mount. Four others. And Matthew is unusual in this. Luke, when he wrote his Gospel, didn't do that. He scattered the sayings of Jesus all the way through the narrative. But Matthew collected them under five themes, which we shall look at in a moment. And he did that for a specific purpose. There were probably sayings that Jesus had said separately, but Matthew said, I'm going to gather them together in five blocks. Now Matthew was Jewish, and the law of Moses was collected in five blocks. The five first books of the Bible, we call them the Pentateuch, which means the five books. The five books of Moses, the five sermons of Jesus. What's Matthew saying? He's saying there's a new law come. It's not the law of Moses anymore. It's the law of Jesus now. Again, we'll come back to that. The structure 
is very interesting. He alternates words with deeds. Has a block of the words of Jesus, then he has a block of the deeds. Then another block of the words, then another block of the deeds. And five times he switches. And so you've got a sandwich. You can see the structure of Matthew in your mind. Five sermons, each followed by five accounts of the deeds that Jesus did which illustrate his sermon. Because you see, Jesus was communicating in word and deed as we should be communicating the gospel in word and deed. People should see and hear. And that's what Matthew is saying. Mark didn't say it. Mark invites us to come and see what Jesus did. But Matthew says, come and hear what he said and see what he did. And he keeps alternating like this. And having got the five-layer sandwich, he then puts the birth story in front and the death and resurrection after. And we've got his gospel. So we can see how he put it together. Now one of the things that does strike us when we read Matthew's Gospel is that it's very Jewish. And it is obviously aimed at Jewish readers. Let's start with a very simple observation. No Jew likes to say God. They are so afraid of taking the name of the Lord in vain that I have never been able to persuade a Jew to tell me how to say Yahweh which I understand is the Hebrew name for God. And you know, I, I've tried to catch them out. I've said, how do you pronounce the name of God? And they say, yep. And then they stop. They say, you're not going to catch me out. And they won't say it. They are desperately afraid of taking the name of the Lord in vain. And therefore, they prefer to say heaven instead of God. They say, heaven help you. Pray to heaven. Heaven bless you. And that is why in Matthew's Gospel you don't find the phrase Kingdom of God as you do all the way through Luke. When Matthew reports Jesus, he reports him as saying Kingdom of Heaven. And that would be a sensitivity towards Jewish readers to say Kingdom of Heaven. If you buy the Jewish Chronicle, you'll never find the word God in it. But you do find frequently a funny capital G and then a little dash, and then a little d. If ever you've read the Jewish Chronicle, you'll find gd all over it. And that's God. You know it's God. But they dare not spell it out fully in case they take his name in vain. So Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. That tells you he's thinking about Jewish readers. Because Matthew, remember, saw Jesus as king of the Jews. And that's a great message that comes all the way through. Now there are other things that tell us that Matthew had Jewish readers in mind. One is that he refers to the Old Testament more than any of the other Gospels. And one of his favorite sayings is that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. And that phrase alone occurs 13 times in the story of Jesus' birth. And he quotes altogether, Micah, Hosea, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, just in the birth story. He's saying something. One of the reasons why Matthew is first in the New Testament, even though it wasn't written first, is that it links with the Old Testament better than all the others. And it seems to provide a continuity. If you've read through the Old Testament and you're steeped in that, then you're just ready for Matthew and see the Old Testament fulfilled in Matthew. There are altogether 29 direct quotations from the Old Testament in this book, but there are 121 references indirect, allusions. 121. Here's a man who's steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. It's why he takes such a long time explaining that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Because the prophets had said, Oh, Bethlehem of Judea, you're the one that's going to produce the king. And so Matthew emphasizes Bethlehem more than any other. You know, once when Jesus was preaching, somebody in the crowd said, Could this be the Messiah? And somebody else answered and said, It can't be, he comes from Nazareth. 
And I'm amazed Jesus kept quiet. It, I couldn't have done, could you? <laughs> I'd have wanted to shout out, you're wrong, he's not from Nazareth, he's from Bethlehem. But Jesus kept that quiet. But Matthew writing for Jewish readers says, he came from Bethlehem, I want you to know. That's why he included the story of the birth. So that Jews would know he was fulfilling the prophets. Then, of course, why was he crucified? That's the big problem to Jews. They cannot understand a king who lets himself be crucified. And Matthew makes it absolutely clear that Jesus was innocent. Keeps emphasizing it. He will not let Jewish readers think that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy and put to death as a criminal and as a man who broke God's law. And there is also a big emphasis in Matthew, as there isn't in any other gospel, on Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And one of the strongest statements in Matthew, which has been a problem to Christians ever since, is Jesus said not one jot or one tittle of the law will pass away. Now, that makes me feel guilty because I'm breaking the law of Moses right now. And I usually do so because uh, a Jewish family helps me to. See, one of the jot or tittles of the Mosaic law is that you mustn't wear suits of mixed material. And St. Michael is my patron saint. <laughs> and it's a Jewish family who helps me to break that law. So, hey, what does Jesus mean? One jot or one tittle? That's going to be a problem we'll have to wrestle with. See, there's another law that if you get dry rot in your house, you've got to burn your house down out of love for your neighbor. <laughs> doesn't say anything about the rentical man. You burn your house down because you love your neighbor. Then it says if you put an extension on your house and it has a flat roof, you've got to put a railing around the flat roof to stop the neighbor's children climbing up and falling over. That's a good one, isn't it? But there are building regulations. There are regulations about clothes and about your toilet arrangements. And Jesus says, not one jot or one tittle of the law will pass. So Matthew tells us this must have been a relief to the Jews because the Jews thought Jesus had come to destroy the law. Matthew said he didn't. He came to get it fulfilled. Well, it means we've got to wrestle with the laws of Moses. And yet having said all this, that Matthew is very much inclined to Jewish readers, I must now tell you, that it's also for Gentile readers. And there's quite a bit of anti-Jewish teaching in Matthew. And Matthew has a lot going for the Gentiles, the wise men coming to see the baby in Bethlehem. We presume, though we're not sure, we presume that they were Gentiles. And right through to the end of the Gospel where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the Gentiles, all the nations, all the ethnic groups out there, all the non-Jews, Go and make disciples of them. So Matthew is not just writing for Jewish readers, as many people have thought. And I've heard many say Matthew is the gospel for Jews. No, it isn't. It's the most helpful one to give to a Jew. And I remember meeting a Jew who was converted through reading Matthew chapter 1. Would you believe it? That's the genealogy, all the begats, you know? When I first read through the Bible, I thought they did nothing but begat in those days, you know. <laughs> begat, 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 all the way through whole chapters of begatting. And there we've got it. Matthew chapter 1, all the begatting. Jesus' family tree. And you know, this Jew was converted because when he read that, he suddenly realized Jesus was a real person. And that's what convinced him, because to a Jew, it's your family tree that establishes you as a person. And he was converted and believed in Jesus from just Matthew chapter 1. So the genealogies have their purposes. But here we have in this gospel a chapter full of woes on Jews. Now I wonder if you know what the word woe means. It's a curse. It's the opposite of the word blessed. And Jesus uttered as many woes as blesseds. Whenever I go to the Sea of Galilee, I always remember the woes of Jesus for this reason. If you go to Israel today, you will stay in a hotel on the shores of Tiberias. Not this week, because I've just heard that the hotels are all flooded with water. 
The Sea of Galilee has just risen like that. All the snow that's come and melted from Hermon and the hotels are flooded. And they thought the Sea of Galilee would take four more years to fill up again. It's now all over the place. But you would stay in Tiberias. Do you know why? See, in Jesus' day, there were 250,000 people living on the shores of Galilee in four major cities, a quarter of a million. It's the most populated area. So, you know, when tourists today see it, they say, oh, isn't it beautiful? I see it just as Jesus saw it, the green hills and, you know, that sheer romanticism. There were a quarter of a million people living around that lake. Where are they? Where are the towns? The answer is this, Jesus said, Woe to you, Capernaum. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Chorazin. And they've all disappeared. The only town he never cursed was Tiberias. And it's still there. I tell you, when Jesus curses, that's something to make you tremble. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus cursed Jews. He said, Woe to you who love to have the chief seats in the synagogue. Woe to you that you like people to call you father and teacher. Woe to you. It's chapter 23 and it's just packed with woes against Jews. So Matthew's being an honest reporter at least. Even if he's writing for Jews, he tells them the truth as Jesus saw it about Jews. Before we leave this side, before we forget the Jewish side for a moment, why would Matthew write so strongly for the Jews? Because the time, by the time he wrote, the church was becoming more and more Gentile and a deep gulf was opening up between Jews and the church. And in fact, by the year AD 85, which would be just after Matthew wrote, by the year AD 85, Christians were being excommunicated from the synagogues. Jewish believers were no longer allowed to worship in a synagogue and the split had come. I remember I got into serious trouble once for saying that neither Abraham nor Moses would be eligible for Israeli citizenship today and there was a dead hush, but it's true. If you are Jewish, you can be an atheist, an agnostic, a Buddhist, anything you like, and you can be a citizen of Israel. But if you're a Jewish believer in Jesus, you can't. And Abraham and Moses both believed in Jesus, as did Elijah, and they wouldn't be eligible for Israeli citizenship. And this is because a great gulf opened up between Jew and Gentile believers between the Jews and the Church of Christ. Because you see, the Church was Jewish in the beginning. All the apostles were Jewish. All the first members were Jewish. And so Matthew is writing for Jewish readers just about the time that split was becoming permanent. Why would he do that? Well, two reasons I can give you. First, he wanted to keep the door open to Jews wanted to keep the relationship with Jews. He was a Jew. They were his people. And Jesus was and is a Jew. And he wanted to keep that door open so that Jews would not feel that they had to keep away from the church. He had a real longing, as Paul had, that the Jews should come to believe in their own Messiah. But the other reason I believe he particularly wrote a gospel that would appeal to Jewish people was this. I believe he wanted Christians never to forget their Jewish roots. And Matthew of all Gospels roots Jesus in Judaism, roots him back in Jewish history, gives us his genealogy back to Abraham and David. And so he's saying to Jews on the one hand, don't run away from Christians. And he's saying to Christians on the other hand, don't run away from Jews. And somehow this gospel brings Jew and Christian together. Always has done. And it's played a unique role in that particular task. Well, we'll have a little break now. And then I want to talk to, to you about the value of Matthew's gospel for us Christians. I'm a Gentile. 
looking around, I think most of you here are Gentile believers. I'm sometimes mistaken for a Jewish believer <laughs> for obvious reasons. It runs in the family, but uh, nevertheless, I'm Gentile. And yet Matthew is a favorite gospel. What has it got to say to us? Well, we'll see in the next talk. Well, now, in the last talk, we looked at Matthew as a gospel for Jewish people. I tried to show you how he angles his viewpoint again and again towards Jewish thinking, how he rooted the gospel of Jesus in the Old Testament, how he explained things for Jews, how he was sensitive in talking about the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. But now we're going to look at Matthew's gospel for Christians. He wrote primarily for believers. I don't know if you realize that two of the four gospels were written for sinners and two were written for Christians. And that's a fundamental division between them and you ought to know which is which, do you? Which do you think? Well, let me put you out of your misery in case you get it wrong. Mark and Luke were written for sinners, for unbelievers. And they are both very suitable to give to people who are not Christians but who want to know about Jesus. Uh, Luke, of course, has those matchless stories of the prodigal son and um, Good Samaritan, and these are very well known. So I think on the whole I would give Luke to an unbeliever. I would never give John. It's a tragedy that John is used so much in evangelism. It's a profound gospel. I don't think an unbeliever can cope with the first three verses of the first chapter, never mind the rest of it. The reason it's used is, of course, we, we hope they'll read as far as chapter 3. And we hope they'll read, you must be born again, and we hope they'll just go a little further and read John 3.16 and get the gospel. But actually the whole of John is not suitable at all. Matthew and John were written for believers, for Christians, already committed. Only they didn't use the term Christian in those days. It was a nickname given by some others to the church, but they usually called themselves disciples. And that's the key word in Matthew's gospel. It's a gospel for disciples. It's a gospel for those who've already committed themselves to following Jesus and learning from him. It's the only gospel to use the word church. Did you ever notice that? Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't, John doesn't, but there it is twice in Matthew's gospel. And it's interesting that he uses the word in two quite different senses. In the first mention, chapter 16, Jesus says, I will build my church. It's just after that great turning point where Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That ended the 30 months in the north and Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem from that day on. And when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, now I can do the two things I came to do. And he used two words he had never used before. One was the word church. He said, now I can build my church. I've got something to build with now. And you can only build the church with those who know who Jesus is. And then he said, and now I can die on a cross. Now he'd never mentioned the word church or the word cross for two and a half years. But now that people knew who he was, he could say, now I can do what I've come to do. Then dear old Peter, you know, he had foot and mouth disease. <laughs> and every time he opened his mouth, he put his foot in it. I mean, he got it right. He said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, now, you didn't discover that for yourself. My father told you. And then he said, now I can build my church. And Peter felt good about that, especially since he was going to be the rock. And then Jesus said, now I can die on a cross. And Peter said, you'll do no such thing. He's just said, you're the king, and now he's telling him what he mustn't do. It's really quite humorous. But when you listen to some Christian prayers, we do quite a bit of that ourselves. So there's the word church, and it clearly refers to the universal church, the whole church of Jesus. And there's only one church of Jesus, and he's building it. Thank God he is. He didn't tell us to build it. He said, I'll build it. And he's doing just that. But then in chapter 18, the second time he uses the word church, it clearly cannot mean the same thing. Because he says, if your brother offends you, go and tell him. If he repents of it, you've won your brother. 
If he refuses to admit he was wrong, take two or three witnesses. If he still refuses to confess it, tell it to the church. Now, if that means the universal church, you'd spend the rest of your life in a jumbo jet. <laughs> so clearly the word church can also be used for a local community to which you can speak. And those are the two meanings of the word church in the New Testament. There's nothing in between. There are no denominational churches in between. There's the church of Jesus, which he's building, and the local church, which is part of that universal church, to which you can take your complaints when necessary. So Matthew is written for the church. And you often find the purpose of a gospel at the end of it. Nowadays we usually try and put the purpose of a book right at the beginning so people know where you're heading. But in those days they usually put the purpose at the end. John's Gospel does, as we'll see in the next talk. But Matthew does, and at the end of his Gospel he says, Now, Jesus, just before he ascended, said, Here's the job I'm giving you to do until I get back. Go and disciple all ethnic groups. Not all nations in the sense of political states but all ethnic groups, baptizing them and then teaching them to observe everything I've told you to do. Now that's what Matthew's Gospel is written for. It's to help disciples by teaching them what Jesus commanded. And Matthew is therefore, we might say, a manual of discipleship. It is by far the best book of the New Testament to take a new convert through. By far the best. It was designed for that. It was designed to teach them how to live now that they are a disciple of Jesus. You see, we weren't told to go and get decisions for Jesus. We were told to go and make disciples. It only starts with a decision. You can get a decision in a few minutes, but to make a disciple takes years. It's a long job. And you disciple someone by teaching them how to live in the kingdom of heaven on earth. And Matthew wrote his gospel precisely for that purpose, so that we could make disciples. That's the second reason why it's the first book in the New Testament. It's the best book for a Christian to begin on. By far the best for someone who's become a Christian disciple, take them through Matthew. And the reason why it's so appropriate is that its theme is the kingdom. The kingdom which is now here, the kingdom which is at hand, the kingdom which you can reach out and grasp, the kingdom in which you can live. You don't have to die to go to heaven. You can live in the kingdom of heaven now. But there's a particular way to live in the kingdom. You're not just in it, you need to live the way that sons of the kingdom are meant to live. Now this is the theme which unites Jewish Israel and Christian church because this is the theme that runs right the way through the Bible. The whole story of the Bible is about the re-establishment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. The rule of God here on this planet. So we've got a theme here that unites Jew and Christian. We are both looking for the Kingdom of God. The only difference is we believe it's already come. But that theme unites us all, Jew and Gentile alike. Now at this point I want to try and explain something to you. The difference between the Jewish expectancy of the Kingdom and the Christian experience of the Kingdom. Let's try and see what happens. To the Jew, the Kingdom was future. Was something that hadn't come yet. And therefore they called it the age to come. And still to this day every Jew is looking for that age to come, that golden age. And it will come when Messiah comes. They don't believe he's come yet, so they're still waiting. And they believe he will come September, October, one of these years. And every September, October they have the Feast of Tabernacles 
which celebrates his coming. And it's thrilling to be with Jewish people at that time. They're looking for the King to bring the Kingdom of Heaven here on earth. That's the centre of their hopes for the future. The present evil age in which we live is ruled by Satan. The devil is the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, the God of this world. Those are titles both Jesus and Paul gave Satan, but they were familiar titles to the Jewish people. So at the moment we live in the present evil age under the rule of Satan, but one day Messiah is going to come at the Feast of Tabernacles, September, October, and he will inaugurate the age to come in which God is king. Now that is the simple hope of the future, which is the heart of Jewish messianic expectancy. But the difference in the Christian hope for the future is this, the Messiah has already come, but he is to come again. And what Jesus calls the secret of the kingdom in the Gospel of Matthew, the secret of the kingdom, is that the Messiah is coming twice, not once. And because he's already come, the age to come has already begun. Can you just see that dotted line? A little faint. The age to come has already broken in. And with Jesus, the kingdom of heaven came in a very real sense. It is now here. But so is the present evil age. It has not replaced that. With Jewish expectancy, when this came, that would finish. With one visit of the Messiah. But with two visits, the two ages overlap. And Paul talks about the overlap of the ages in which we live. And the reason we are in tension, the reason Christians are frustrated, the reasons we are persecuted, is that we're living in the overlap of the ages. Do you follow me? And our task is to get people out of this into this. And the reason it had to happen this way was this, the Jews think that they're all good enough to go straight into this. But they're not, which is why John the Baptist told them they had to get cleaned up, get baptized in the muddy Jordan, get their sins washed away, get ready for the coming kingdom. You see, if actually Messiah came and ended the present evil age and with it everybody who does evil, who would be left? So he came the first time to get people ready for the kingdom, to get their sins cleaned up and to prepare them so that when the age to come arrived in its fullness, there would be a whole lot of people ready to go into it and live under the rule of God. Now can you see why the overlap was needed? You see, the assumption was every Jew thought, well, I'm okay, I'm one of God's chosen people. I'll be in the age to come. You know, once somebody came to Jesus and said, blessed will he be who sits down at the feast of the kingdom. And Jesus' response was, are you sure you'll be there? Now, our task in evangelism is to get people across from one to the other. The age to come has already begun. In a sense, we are the people of the future. We are already in the kingdom and yet we don't yet see it fully established because we still see the present evil age continuing. And there's a battle going on between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Christ right now. And there's a tension. But thousands are crossing from one to the other. Every minute I talk to you, there are 45 people who have crossed over from one to the other. 2,000 new churches every week. See. So people are transferring, but it's not just getting them out of this kingdom, it's getting them ready for this one. And that means teaching them to live as sons of the kingdom. And so Matthew's whole theme of his gospel is, how do you live in the kingdom now? And all the teaching of Jesus that he could remember, he gathered together under five headings. 
And those are the five sermons. I wish the other four were as well known as the Sermon on the Mount because they're just as important. Let's have a look at some of them right now. I've given them titles, those five blocks of teaching, those five sermons. There's only one on the Mount, the rest were in other places. But here are the five sermons and they're all about how to be subjects of the kingdom. Because you can't have a kingdom without a sovereign and subjects, without a good king and without good citizens. So here are the five subjects. The Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, is about the lifestyle of the kingdom. How we live now that we're in the kingdom. Listen, the Sermon on the Mount is not Jesus' advice to unbelievers on how to live. It's difficult enough for a believer to live this way. Never mind an unbeliever. It's for how we're to live. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He's describing a new kind of person, a new man, a new woman, and he's going to tell them how to live. We'll come back to that in a moment. The second, that's in chapters 5 to 7, the second block of teaching that Matthew has gathered together around one theme, though he's pulled it from all over the place, is the mission of the kingdom because one of the things we need to learn is as soon as you got into the kingdom, you have a mission to go and bring others in. And the sooner you start, the easier it gets. The longer you leave it, the harder it gets. The best evangelists are the new converts. And as soon as they've learned how to live themselves in the kingdom, they need to be taught how to go out and bring others. And Jesus teaches in chapters 9 and 10 how to evangelize. He said it's simple. You just go out two by two and you raise the dead and you, uh, you heal AIDS, you cast out demons, you heal the sick and then you tell them the kingdom's coming. That's all. Let them see it, then let them hear it, de demonstrate it, then declare it. It's so simple. We try and make people hear it before they see it, you know. Much better to let them see it before they hear it. And I can imagine James and John going down the main street of the first town, hoping they wouldn't meet a demoniac. <laughs> you know? And suddenly, suddenly, there he is going berserk in the market square. And James would say, there was a fish and chip shop back there, look. Um, <laughs> We'll go and get some supper and if he's still there in the morning, we'll minister to him. And John would say, no, James, you're being a coward. You do the first one and, <laughs> and I'll do the second one. And while you're doing it, I'll be praying you through around the corner. <laughs> now, I know that's how they went out because when they came back, they were just so excited. They said, even the demons do what we tell them. And Jesus said, cool it, cool it. Don't get excited about power. You just be happy that God wrote your name. And Jesus got overexcited then. And he said, I was watching Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Notice the tense of the verb. I was watching Satan fall. While you went out two by two, I was looking at Satan to see what happened to him. And I saw him keel over. And Jesus just shouted with delight, said, Father, thank you that you didn't use clever people or rich people, but these lads here and he knew that it was going to work. That ordinary people going out in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit can bring Satan crashing. You're allowed to whisper hallelujah if you feel like it. <laughs> That's the mission of the kingdom. And if you read chapters 9 and 10, you'll find out exactly how we're to go out and how we're to meet with opposition, how we're to cope with people who don't like us. It's all there. The third bunch of teaching comes in chapter 13 and it's all about what to expect. See, it's very important is morale. Morale is usually the decisive factor in any battle, whether you think you're going to win or not. And in Matthew 13, you've got a whole lot of parables of the kingdom. It starts with the parable of the sower. And Jesus is saying, don't worry if three out of every four seeds comes to nothing because from the one seed you'll get 30, 60 and 100 fold. Don't be disappointed when you cast your seed on hard ground or weedy ground. 
don't be disappointed because the harvest is going to be worth it. And then he talked about the wheat and the tares growing together. He said, don't go out trying to pull tares up. That's not your job. But unfortunately, Christians get a bit more excited about tear pulling than seed planting sometimes. You know what I mean? We're not into tear pulling. The tares are going to grow. Jesus said the kingdom of Satan is going to grow alongside the kingdom of God. Both will grow together. Don't worry, at the harvest they'll be separated. So if Satan seems to be getting stronger, don't worry, Jesus said he would. The kingdom of God's getting stronger too. Both are growing together. See, He's filling them with hope. And he said, if you take a grain of mustard seed, now that's very, very small. You've got to have about 50 in your hand before you can see them. Tiny, tiny things. And yet he said it becomes a big tree. He said that's what the kingdom's going to be like. And it sure has been. He started with 11 good men and now he has 1,500 million. And the church is the only society that never loses customers by death. You see? And so it never gets any smaller. It gets bigger and bigger and from this little mustard seed is a big tree. Now that's all in chapter 13. Whenever you're a bit downcast, read chapter 13. The growth of the kingdom. He says, the kingdom, he said, it's like this, if you're looking for precious pearls and you find one bigger and better than all your pearls, you'd get rid of the whole lot just for that one. He'd say, that's the one I want. So that's how you should feel about the kingdom. You may have lost a whole lot of other things, but boy, you've, you've found the pearl of great price for which you'd sacrifice everything. And he says, don't worry about bad converts. He said, the kingdom of heaven's like a net and it gets filled with all kinds of fish, both good and bad. He says, don't worry about that. It'll be sorted out when the net's pulled to shore. Just get the net full. Now, pastors hate that parable. They never preach on it. <laughs> you know, pastor would rather have a hundred good members than a thousand bad ones. But Jesus says, get the net full. Pastors love to go after the one lost sheep. You know? But uh, you can always tell a pastor from an evangelist. An evangelist goes fishing with a net, but a pastor goes with a rod and line. You know? <laughs> the, fourth, the fourth teaching on the kingdom is on the community of the kingdom. That's where the teaching of the church comes in. That's where we're to go looking for the lost sheep who are backsliding Christians. That's where we're to deal with people who offend us by telling the church, sharing it with the church. That's where Jesus talks about church discipline. Now you see, all these are things that the new convert needs to know, aren't they? These are the very subjects that someone who's just come into the kingdom needs to be taught about. And the final one, chapter 24 and 25, is the future of the kingdom and the return of the king. And it was when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, just before he died, they said, when will your coming be? And what will be the signs of it? How will we know when you're near? And he gave them four crystal clear signs. And I'm really going to frustrate you. I'm not going to tell you those signs because they're on another video. <laughs> but he gave them four crystal clear signs so that they would have something to watch for as well as pray for and they would know when he was nearly back. And then he told them some pretty stark parables just to the twelve. He said, now how can you be ready for the king when he gets back? The interesting thing there is that in every parable there's a phrase, the master was a long time coming. The real test of whether you're ready for the Lord's return is not what you would do if you think it's next Tuesday, but what you would do if it's not for another thousand years. That's the real test because he's not bothered about what you're doing in the last few days before he gets back. He's concerned with what you've been doing all the time he's been away, whether you've been faithful, using your talents, keeping your lamp lit. That's what he's concerned about when he gets back. Some people think, oh, I've got to be doing the right thing when he gets back. No, you've got to be doing the right thing now, whether his coming is near or far. Go back to the lifestyle because that's the one that really gets you. You know, Jesus says, you've heard the law of Moses, but he said, my law's a bit different. Law of Moses said, you mustn't murder people, but I say if you've wished anybody dead, you've murdered them. If you've called somebody an idiot, 
you're a murderer. That's tough. The law of Moses said, don't climb into bed with a woman you're not married to. My law says, Jesus, you don't look at a girl and think you'd like to. And you don't divorce and remarry. It's tough, isn't it? And the worst one of all was this, he said, and my law states, you must not worry. Now that's why you never see a Christian worried. <laughs> see? Why is it that every time I say that, we get a laugh? Because Jesus didn't intend it as a joke. We laugh it off because it's a bit too uncomfortable to listen to it. I'm not putting you down because you laughed, but we laugh. And yet Jesus said, if you worry, you are libeling the King of Heaven. You're saying he cares more about his pets and his garden than he does about his kids. Clothes the grass of the field and he feeds the birds of the air, but me, I'm just his child, I have to worry. You go through the Sermon on the Mount. A man walked up to me on the promenade in Douglas in the Isle of Man. He said, I hear you are saying that a man can't be a Christian and a Freemason at the same time. I said, that's right, I do say that. He said, I'll give you two minutes to prove it, and if you can prove it in two minutes, I'll resign. And I got my watch off and I said, right. I said, we're starting now. I said, Jesus taught us how to live in the kingdom. One thing he said was, you never wish anybody dead. But I said, the first oath you took was a bloody oath about what you'd do to anybody who betrayed the secrets. And he was just going to say, but I didn't really mean it, nobody means it. And I knew he was going to say that because they all do. And I said, now listen, something else he said in the Sermon on the Mount was, let your yes be yes and your no be no, which means always mean what you say. I said, that's two minutes. And bless him, he resigned that afternoon. But you see, the Sermon on the Mount really gets down to the nitty gritty about lending to people who want to borrow from you, about not paying people back. It's tough stuff, but it's the lifestyle of the kingdom. So if you lead someone to Christ, take them through Matthew's Gospel. Teach them about the Kingdom of Heaven that they've now entered. Teach them how to live in it, how to spread it, how to expect more of it to grow, how to get ready, how to live in a community of the Kingdom, the Church, and above all, how to get ready for the King coming back to inaugurate the full age to come, here and now. Well, now that means there are certain special themes in Matthew, but before we get to that, do you notice what I've written here? One of the points that Matthew makes 44 times in his Gospel is that we are not just subjects of the Kingdom, we're sons of the Father. For the King of the Kingdom is also our Father. Nobody but nobody mentions Father so much as Matthew. Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't, but Matthew does. Altogether, 44 times. I just counted up in Mark four times. In Luke, as you might expect, a few more, 17. But in Matthew, 44. And it's very important when we are seeking to live as subjects of the King of Heaven to remember that we can call him Abba Father, that we're sons as well as subjects. Otherwise, you can get into legalism. And we shall say more about that when we talk together about Galatians. But legalism is a great enemy of the Christian life. When you get into law, if that's all you can see and just regard yourself as a subject of the King, you're going to miss something very important. Now, let's move on to the final thing I want to say about Matthew. There are three important themes that Matthew picks up, all of them fundamental to discipleship in the Kingdom. That's his theme, how to be a disciple of Jesus, how to go on with Jesus once you've come to him. The first theme that comes up again and again and again is the theme of faith. A subject of the Kingdom, a son of the Father, lives by faith, by believing, by going on believing. I'm not going to say more about that because we'll say much more when we come to John. But time and again Jesus asks people in Matthew, do you believe? Do you really believe what I've told you? Do you believe what, that I can do this? Do you believe? Do you believe? 
That's the first thing Jesus is after in a disciple, a continued trust in him. But the second theme of Matthew, which you don't find in Mark, Luke or John at all, is the theme of righteousness. And that's the theme of doing as well as believing. And it comes in that order. You believe first, but you believe in order to do. The shortest parable in Matthew is one that I've never heard preached on. A certain man had two sons. And he said to his sons, go and work in the vineyard. And one said, yes, but he didn't go. And the other said, no, but he went. Which of the two did the will of his father? Now it's the smallest parable of all and it's the simplest. We don't like it doing much because it's about doing. It's a wonderful parable. It's not what you say, it's what you do that the Father's concerned with. You can profess things but you can lie. I suppose I've told more lies in church than outside church. I've usually sung them to nice music. But you know when you look at some of the choruses, I honestly can't sing them. It would be a lie to sing them. I would just be saying something that isn't true. And the Father is concerned with what we do. Now that we're his disciples, believing in him, now is the time to do righteousness. And that's why Matthew tells us why Jesus was baptized. I mean, if there's one person who could say, I don't need to be baptized, it was Jesus. Had no sins to wash away, nothing to cleanse. And yet he came and John said, you should be baptizing me, which tells me that the first Baptist was never baptized. Don't tell the Baptist that, but anyway. John said, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, baptize me. For it's right for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now that was an example Jesus is giving us. You do what's right, whether you think you need to or not. Righteousness means doing it. It wasn't for him an act of repentance as it was for everybody else, but it was an act of righteousness. His father had told him to do it, so he did it. He didn't argue, he didn't say, Father, I don't need baptism. He said, it's right to do what's right. And this theme, righteousness, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom. And they were pretty righteous, you know. They fasted twice in the week. They gave tithes of all that they possessed. They compassed sea and land to make one proselyte. They were great missionaries. They read their Bibles. They prayed. They gave. And Jesus said, you've got to do, do better than that. Your righteousness must exceed that. This term righteousness comes all the way through Matthew's Gospel. You're not saved by righteousness, but you are saved for righteousness. That's what he's saying. And that's why it's dangerous to give Matthew to an unbeliever. Because he will get the impression that being a Christian is doing good. But you see, being a Christian is doing good after you become a Christian. Do you follow? So don't give Matthew to unbelievers or he'll try and become a do-gooder. And that's not a Christian. But once you've been saved and forgiven, then comes righteousness of doing. And the third and last theme that comes in Matthew for disciples is the theme of judgment. There is more of judgment in Matthew than in Mark, Luke or John. And yet he's writing for people who would say they're saved. Now I've just produced another book, it came out on Friday. It's already causing a s no small stir. <laughs> it's a book on hell. And there will be a number of shocks for a number of people. I've tried to be as faithful to the Bible as I can. There are many now who don't believe in it anymore, I'm sure you know that. And this is a book to say Jesus believed in it and I'm not prepared to call him a liar. But what I've pointed out in this book is a shock. Most of the teaching we have on hell comes from Jesus, not from Paul, not from John, and there's nothing in the Old Testament about hell. It all comes from the lips of Jesus. And when somebody says to me, how can a God of love send anyone to hell? I say, 
Jesus knew more about God's love than anybody else, and yet he believed that could happen. And I'm not prepared to call him a liar. But here's the thing, not only does all our information about hell come from the lips of Jesus, almost all of it comes in Matthew's Gospel. Not in the Gospels for unbelievers, but in the Gospel for believers. And when you look carefully at the context of each warning, you discover that all but two of his warnings were given to born-again believers, to disciples. Now that's the big shock this book will bring. And I've read a number of books on hell, which others have written, all of them very old because nobody's been writing on it recently, or very few. None of them seem to have noticed this. They all seem to throw hell at other people. I think that's offensive. It's a kind of blow you, Jack, I'm all right. You know, I'm going to heaven and you're going to hell thing. I think we've got to fear hell ourselves. And Jesus gave warning after warning. He, twice he warned the Pharisees. But he never warned sinners. Isn't that amazing? But the rest of the times he warned those who'd left all to follow him. Let's take just one example. He said, and I'm sure you know these words, don't fear those who can kill your body and after that do nothing. You fear him who can destroy body and soul in hell. Who is he talking to? Sinners? No. Pharisees? No. He was talking to Christian missionaries just before he sent them out to declare and demonstrate the kingdom. It's in Matthew chapter 10 and it's for missionaries. And he didn't say go and tell them they're going to hell. He said you fear it yourself and then you won't fear anything or anyone else. You fear the God who could put you there and you won't be afraid of anybody else. Now that of course raises enormous questions, but if we had only the Gospel of Matthew in the whole New Testament, we would have enough to know that Christians should fear finishing up on God's rubbish heap which he called Gehenna, that valley outside Jerusalem where everything useless was thrown to be burnt up. So Matthew is a sobering gospel for disciples, teaches them to be serious, teaches them to press on, to go on believing, to go all the way with Jesus. And it's a very necessary book for us to be teaching and reading and learning today. Why then did Matthew put all this teaching, the five blocks of teaching, into the framework of Mark's Gospel. Why didn't he just call it a manual of discipleship and just give us the teaching which a disciple needs so that having come to Christ we could just give them these bits in a booklet form and say, now this is what you need to know. I'll tell you why. Because we must never separate the words of Jesus from his deeds and we must never get away from the cross. Do you see? It's dangerous to teach people how to live the Christian life without giving them that teaching in the framework of Christ died for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've never got to forget the gospel and the good news of what Jesus has done for us because if we only hear about what we should now be doing for him, we shall get proud we shall become Pharisees, we shall get legalistic, we shall become do-gooding Christians and we shall forget our gratitude to Jesus for all he's done. And so Matthew wisely said, I want to give the disciples teaching in the framework of the good news that the Jesus who demanded this of his followers was the Jesus who healed the sick, raised the dead and died for us and rose again for us. So go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. That's how it finishes. Go and lo. Trouble is too many people want the lo without the blow, without the go. <laughs> See, there's a condition there. Lo, I'm with you always, but it's only true if you go and make disciples. And if somebody says to me, I've lost my sense of the presence of the Lord, I say, well, Go and bring someone else to him <laughs> and straight away you'll find that he's back with you. 
because he's promised that when you go low, I'm with you. Amen.